Hey, this is Eric from Catching Light. Hey, this is Hemp. Hey, this is Glenn. Hi, I'm Steve-O. Hey, this is Drew Hines with Hindsight Imagery. This is Matt Callahan and Digimati Photographic Services. Hey, this is Jason, and welcome to Tales from the Pit. Hello and welcome to Tales from the Pit, the behind the lens access to the entertainment world and the creative people involved. Today we have director of photography for films like Terminator Salvation, Semi Pro, Need for Speed, Act of Valor, TV shows like Into the Badlands, and some of my personal, in my opinion, the best music videos of the 90s. And you also have the Filmmakers Academy. Welcome Shane Herbert to the show. Thank you for being here. Ah, thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate this very much. And I'm looking forward to a a really great discussion. (laughs) So if you don't mind, we'd like to start off with maybe you giving us your journey so far, kind of give us an overview of how you got into the industry. What was your influences and stuff like that, that pushed you in the directions you're at right now? Yeah. So my journey was uh, kind of a very unique one. Um, I went to film school, uh, got out of film school. I was in Boston at the time. So I went to Emerson College and I came out of there thinking I was going to be a producer. Um, I really didn't like lighting. I wasn't into director photography. I didn't like much of that stuff. I, I could convince anyone to do anything I wanted them to do. And I was good with money and making things work, right? So I thought, all right, so I'm going to pound the payment. And my mom bought me a nice three-piece suit. And I started knocking on all the doors. And uh, after the 20th slammed in my face, you know, trying to get a intro level job, I, I went back to my internship, which was at a rental house. So I started packing grip trucks again and and starting to do that and uh, worked my way up the ladder within the rental house. And within three months, I was running the whole rental division. Uh, And then I was going out on jobs as a grip truck driver and a grip and an electric. And that's where I started to really fall in love with lighting and fall in love with because I grew up on a farm and farming is a lot of common sense. And it's also a lot of thinking on your feet very quickly. Uh, Weather comes in, you know, uh, stuff breaks and you have to fix it and you can't usually get the part. So you have to weld stuff together. So I just had this very kind of common sense nature to uh, just, figuring stuff out. So that pushed me into gripping. So I started as a grip and then I became a dolly grip and then I became a key grip. Um, And then from key grip, I moved on to a best boy electric and then to a gaffer and then to a director of photography. Now, in between, I did some camera house stuff as well. So rental house wise, I learned how to load film and and prep all the cameras and, you know, understand all the camera side uh, to everything. So it was very much on the technical side of it all, uh, moving up the ladder. And, you know, it just my big break, let's say, where that light bulb went off where I decided I was going to be a cinematographer was on this really, you know, cheesy B horror film called Phantasm 2. This summer, the ball is back, right? And uh, so I was, um, I was working as a grip truck driver. I was getting paid $350 a week. And it was a six-day week. And I was the driver, so I was doing 18-hour days. I think it averaged out to be like 52 cents an hour or something like that. I was working and making, 
but whatever it was, uh, it was that experience was really when the light bulb uh, turned on for me because I got called on the truck. They're like, you know, Terry needs a 18 by 24 flag run in. So I grab it out of the grip truck and I run down and I'm going into this crematorium set. And the crematorium set was, you know, it, it had the big ovens and stairs that led down. And I was walking down the stairs with the flag. And my friend, who was the best boy electric, stopped me. And he goes, Shane, would you be scared? And I go, Brian, what, what are you talking about? I got to get this flag down to Terry or he's going to yell at me. And he goes, no, look, every nook and cranny is lit in this set. There's no shadow. And it was like, bang. From that point on, everything I looked at was light. I just, I started, you know, Roger Deakins and, and uh, Chivo and all the, the artists of the time, you know, the director of photography at the time. I just couldn't get enough of them. And I just was studying all their work. And I went from a basically a grip truck driver in 1988 to shooting my first music video in 1991. And then I was off to the races. Nice. So, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about <laughs> there. Definitely. Uh, going back just a little bit. So when you went to Emerson, because I mean, uh, it sounds like uh, if I, if I think I read correctly, you're Northern New York raised yes. right? or New England. Yeah, I was uh, around Ithaca, New York. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ithaca, Syracuse, that area. Yeah. Yeah. We're our, our venues based out in New Hampshire. And so, you know, we're New England people. So yeah. certainly understand the farm perspective and, you know, being the MacGyver for whatever exactly. happens. Exactly. MacGyver. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> when, so, so you, so you went to Emerson, um, what was, was there a drive to get into the film industry going into Emerson or were you just kind of not sure what you wanted to do? What was, what pushed you towards that school? Yeah. So originally, um, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew I loved music. Like I loved music so much. And I was a DJ and I also had an air band and we performed all over New York state and the Catskills, the Adirondacks, you know, all over the place. So I knew I wanted to do something that was music related. So I was looking at schools and my parents were, you know, they were working three jobs. We were, you know, lower middle class. We didn't have a lot of money. And my parents were willing to pay for my education. Uh, so I just didn't want to waste it. I didn't want to waste that money, uh, you know, that they had earned. Um, so I said, you know, why don't I go to a little community college to figure it out and see what I love? And that's when I went to Herkimer County Community College, which is up in just the below the Adirondacks. And it had a radio and a television program, two year degree. So I went thinking I was going to be a DJ. You know, I started in the radio station and love and life and, you know, loved radio the first year. Second year was television, fell in love with that. And then I, when I was in high school, I had put kind of all my effort into sports. I love sports. I played almost every sport, uh, tennis, golf, you know, basketball, baseball, soccer, football. So when I went to college, I kind of dropped all that. So I was kind of a B honor student in high school because I put most of my energy in working on the farm and playing sports. Yep. So when I got to college, I dropped all the sports, put all my focus on getting good grades, and then landed this massive scholarship out of Herkimer. So my parents didn't even have to end up paying for Emerson. Amazing. Uh, they, they paid for housing, but all the, the tuition and everything was all paid for with the scholarship that I got out of the junior college. Nice. Right? And so that's when... 
when television really landed for me uh, that second year, I really started to get behind the camera and started to see it. And I was like, all right, this is something I really like. And then I went home that summer and my friend, Gabe Torres, who had gone to USC film school, he had, he was back in town and he was making his practicum final film. And he asked me if I wanted to work on it. And I said, well, yeah. And the thing was all nights. So I worked in the day and then worked on that thing at night. And I just fell in love with film. I fell in love and I changed because I was going into Emerson as a mass comm major and I flipped my whole major um, and turned it into film. So I ended up graduating almost with like two, mi a minor and a major, a minor in mass comm and a major in, in, in like a BFA in, in film. That's, you know, that's that first moment, uh, you know, I do, I do low budget and, and, uh, corporate video stuff like that. And the first time I worked on that film and you're behind the scenes and you're working on this stuff, it just changes your whole perspective on the filming industry. Cause now you're looking at it through the opposite side of the lens. I mean, I, I'm assuming that was your first experience working on that. That sort of changed your perspective on the whole. Because now when I watch movies, ever since that first time I did that, I'm watching a whole different movie than everyone else is now. No, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just, every nuance of like the, the, because his film had like miniature work and also, you know, uh, non-miniature, you know, regular uh, movie making. And, and, uh, and I just got, I just started to love every nuance of it. I couldn't get enough of it. And yep. that really struck that passion. And, you know, I blasted out of Emerson and, and uh, you know, just tried to get a job and in, in doing whatever possible in the movie industry somehow. And, and when I reached a, a, a great level in Boston, I realized that I was moving up faster than anyone really wanted me to move up. So they basically said, Shane, you know, when this guy dies or retires, you'll be able to move up to the next position. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's go to Los Angeles where I can, you know, get in with a huge uh, market there and really make it my own and not worry about uh, the seniority of, you know, this, the city of Boston. So, it, it, so um, that move. Um, um, so in regards to your film, we'll, we'll kind of get to the filmmakers Academy in just a moment, but you and your yeah. wife, Lydia are, uh, you know, I listen to all the podcasts and I, I think that you guys have a, a perfect combination for each other with, you know, you doing the, the, the filming and work. And then she does the business side of stuff. And she has, you know, you guys have, you know, she's focused on the health and a lot of the stuff that you say is the same exact stuff me and my wife go through as well. So uh, were you married at the time of moving to Los Angeles? Were you guys no, together we at that time? we were engaged. We were okay. engaged. So how is we've that? Yeah, sorry. We, we've been together since, I mean, I met her at three years old. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> and she used to come to our house because her dad was a Presbyterian minister and my great grandmother was bedridden. So every Sunday he would bring communion to her and then uh, Lydia and I would play, uh, you know, while she was, you know, while he was giving communion to my great grandmother. And that's yeah. when we first met. And then we started dating in ninth grade. And really never stopped. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a really <laughs> nice, it's really nice to see, you know, people that can have those long childhood relationships their entire life and still have that connection and understanding of each other's. And we'll kind of get more into that a little bit. But what was that conversation about moving to LA like for a family of, you know, uh, uh, being engaged and all that stuff? Was that like an easy conversation? Was it obvious that this had to be done? No, it was not easy um, because Lydia really loved the East Coast and she, you know, all her friends were there and, uh, you know, she just didn't really want to leave. But she, once I 
really convinced her to say, you know, you're working as a nurse, you can work anywhere. Right. Why don't we go out West and try it and, and yep. see what it's like. And it took about three or four years for her to really find the friends, find the network, get settled. Now she absolutely loves it here. I mean, we've been here for since 1987. So we've wow. been here a long time and nice. uh, we're, we're never leaving Southern <laughs> California. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice, nice. So moving forward, you move out to LA. Um, how, and I think you've probably talked about this in the, on your show, but how fast do you get into the industry after moving to LA or how long does it take you to get it, it to get work? Well, it was really tough in the beginning. Um, the rental house thing was a good opener. Like that was the, it had worked for me in Boston. So I thought, why not start all at the bottom again? It's like, cause I had, I was like uh, the marketing guy at the rental house as well as going out on the job. So I was, you know, making all the deals, putting all the the gear together, you know, making sure, you know, produ talking to producers, you know, I was doing like, you know, all these music videos and Spencer for hire was in town when I was there and, <laughs> you know, uh, Robert Urich and all that show was going in Boston. So I was working a lot of that stuff. Um, but the, uh, where, where the hell were we going with this? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just wondering how, how hard was it for you when you first oh, yeah. to LA? Yeah. So when I got to LA, um, I said, all right, let's just start right at the rental house again. So I can start, you know, meeting people because, you know, there's gaffers and key grips that come in to prep the trucks and everything. And I wanted to be seen as this guy that's like really passionate and ambitious. So, you know, when everyone else would walk, I would run. Right. So, and this guy, this producer was there and he was making a deal for a movie and he was looking through the window in the second story. And he noticed me running across the parking lot back and forth. And there, and the guy's like, who's that guy? And he goes, Oh, this is a new guy from Boston. He's fired up. You know, he, he really wants to be in this business. I'll tell you that much. And sure enough, that producer ended up coming down and talking to me. And that was my first gig. Right. So it's like, you know, there's so many people that want to get in the movie industry. And I constantly say this to anyone that wants to break in. You need to shine a spotlight on yourself to get noticed. And whether that is with hustling around and doing all this stuff where people are like, God damn, man, that guy is just all over it. He just can't. Or it's doing the small, subtle things. Like when I was at a, at a camera rental house, I was like, I want to get out of here. I've been here way too long. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to call up the first AC. I'm going to, you know, I get his thing all prepped, all the lenses and everything. I'm going to label all the cases. I'm going to get Velcro and I'm going to create all the tabs for his map box for all his filters and everything. And then I'll ask him, you know, do we need to come in and you know, pick up any carts for you? Or what about, uh, you know, what do you like in your coffee? And what do you want for breakfast? <laughs> and, you know, I was out of there the next week, I, I was gone. Yeah, he, you know, grabbed me immediately. And I was out, you know, loading film on on sets. So these are the little things that show. And that's how I was able to break into it. It was very hard in the beginning, because once you get the first job, it's hard to get the second and third and fourth because, you know, there's a lull and, and of, of, you know, you had that one feature film that I had that I got paid $350 a week. And then, then it just went dry. Uh, I couldn't get, I felt, oh my God, I left the rental house. I, I'm trying to do this freelance thing. I didn't work for four or five months. And then I started taking these uh, deferred pay, you know, freebies, uh, because you never got paid, even though they deferred it, you, the <laughs> thing never, ever made money. And they were all right. the C and D movies. I did space sluts in the slammer, uh, a girl to kill for uh, death row diner, uh, Memorial day massacre. I was just doing all these deferred pay, uh, things just to, 
gain experience and and uh, and then slowly I started getting bigger projects and I actually was getting paid for them, but it, it is a struggle. Yeah. And the industry, you know, will spit you out very quickly if you don't have what I call alligator skin, where you know, you got to have resiliency because this it's just not easy. Yeah, uh, I, I want to talk more about that in just a few moments, but I, I kind of, I mean, the real thing that I was lo- really wanted to talk to you about is the music video stuff. Obviously, we're we're focused on our music entertainment here for what we do. We are photographers yeah. for Live Nation. Um, you have worked with, as I said earlier, some of the best music videos, I think, in the history of rock and roll or the music industry so far. Uh, can you... Um, Give me, I, I think you, I think you've mentioned uh, the, I think probably the most iconic one for me. Well, actually it's probably a couple, but the Guns N' Roses November Rain, I think you said you worked on. Yeah. I'd like to talk about that. Uh, you've done Nirvana. You've done Rolling Stones. Um, you've done a lot with um, um, uh, Smash Mouth, was it? No, no, no. Um, uh, Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, yeah. Um, Stone Temple Pilots. Yep. Live. Uh, yeah, I, I had, uh, I was really into that grunge era. I worked with this one, uh, director called Kevin Kerslake. Um, and he was just a hot ticket and, and just an amazing director and very experimental. Uh, you know, he was a director and he shot as well. And, and so he really taught me so much in this business about really pushing the envelope to the extreme, like the stuff that we would do together, the way we would cross process film and shoot super eight and drag it down our driveway and process it in our own bathtub. You know, (laughs) these are the crazy things you, you do in music videos. Uh, What I loved about it so much was, you know, you could fail, you know, and I tried the craziest shit on the planet. Just so if you failed, it was kind of okay back then, you know? And uh, so you learn real quickly when you have the ability to fail and still move forward. You know, the failure doesn't mean you, you know, don't work ever again. The failure is like, whoa, you did that and it failed, but God, it's really kind of unique. I want to use, you know, so it's right. The failure becomes a success, let's say, uh, yeah. when it's all said and done. So, so with a lot of those artists, so for, for example, the Guns N' Roses stuff, what was your role in that particular video? So the first one I did, Don't Cry, I was the key grip for Daniel Pearl, who was the shooter. Okay. On November Rain, it was, it was kind of a mixed bag because they, uh, Andy Morhan, who was the director, I had worked with. Christ, I had probably done 30 music videos with this director and we had a really great relationship. And he brought in Mike Southern uh, to be the quote unquote director of photography, but he was much more a camera based director of photography. So I became like the lighting, you know, I lit everything. I lit all the music videos. So it was kind of a, almost a tag team uh, for that. And, um, yeah, I mean, craziest stories on that music video ever. Um, I'll never forget. Here's, here's a good one. So we're going to have a wedding, right? And Axl Rose is going to marry Stephanie Seymour. Okay. This is great. All right. Wonderful. We'll, we'll, you know, shoot it during the daytime and it's going to be awesome. And we'll get the, the light, the glow, all the beautiful stained glass. And they're like, uh, Shane. Axel doesn't work in the day. He sleeps in the day and he's up at night. And I'm like, yeah, but this, this church is 350 feet long and it's got all these stained glass windows and rosary windows and all this stuff. What what do you mean? He goes, well, we have to create day at night. (laughs) Right? So I'm like, Okay. Um, so I'm looking, looking at my thing and I'm like, okay, well, Jesus, these stained glass windows are as thick as bricks. So we brought in 
56 18 Ks on scaffolding towers that went out on the outside. And we put an 18 K, I think there was three 18 Ks per window. Right. And like I said, this thing was a massive, uh, you know, church. And then I brought in two Musco lights to light up the rosary windows in each direction. So I figured that out. Okay, great. I got, I can glow some windows and I can shoot shafts through the big rosary windows, but where's the ambience? And it's like, my God, you know, you go into a church during the day and there's this, all this ambient light. I mean, there's light coming through the windows, but there's this ambience. How am I going to create that? And I think I have these things, what I call light mares, where I'll wake up in the middle of the night with the solution. And sure enough on that one, I woke up in the middle of the night and I go, oh my God, there were, there were, um, there were these, uh, skylights at the top of the, the gable of the roof. I said, what we'll do is we'll go in there. We'll have a team take the skylight out. We'll drop chain motors down and suspend this massive uh, rig. And then I'll hang all these coupe lights on it and suck it up to the ceiling. And that's going to create my ambience. Right. And it was like, when that all of a sudden started happening and I'll never forget walking into the church and we had eight generators four out, you know, the cable that powers everything up was uh, 20 feet wide of just, they call it a river, river of four out. And it's just going to all these different generators, powering all these lights. And I walk in and I'm watching this, you know, uh, rock and roll trust just hang, 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 suck up into the ceiling and I'll never forget, uh, Annie Morhan came to me and goes, Shane, this is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how we were able to light the scene. So it felt like it was during the day, but it was only at night with Axel. And, that's a, and that kind of goes back to my statement earlier about once you work on this stuff, you never be able, you're never able to see the, the film or video, or whatever, in the same manner as the average you know, consumer or whatever, because exactly. there's so much more going behind the scenes. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, were you part, it wasn't like Slash doing a guitar solo in the middle of the desert or something like that or, or something like that. I forget what yeah, it was. Yeah, the, the uh, Daniel Pearl was operating that uh, helicopter shot. Uh, right. He was using an old Tyler mount with the zoom and everything on that. Yep. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it was it was you, a really cool music video. You worked with uh, Nirvana on some of their videos. Is that right? And which, yeah, which videos I did. were those? Come As You Are, Lithium, and In Bloom. And was your role pretty much the same role working on the lighting and stuff? No, that was director of photography. Oh, you were? Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, any, any sort of interesting stories about them at all? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, working with Nirvana, the In Bloom was really funny because we... Um, Kevin Kerslake was the director again, and he wanted the um, he wanted to do it like the old uh, Tonight Show, uh, and so we shot it with these. We got these RCA Victor, um, you know, old studio cameras, and back in the day, they used kinescope, right? So you you filmed, and then they with the video. And then on the monitor, they shot a film camera and, and did the process. So then that, that was basically your capture is, is, was that. So the, the, you didn't necessarily record it on videotape. It was the video camera that went into a television and then you filmed off of the TV. Yep. Yep. So that was the concept that, that we wanted to go for. So we had these old, RCA Victor, and they had like a 25, a 50, and a 100 mil on the turret. Yep. And it was all black and white. And we had gotten this set from Warner Brothers that was priceless. It was like from Casablanca. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I remember um, the producer, you know, coming to all of us and, and got us all together as well as the band and, and everything. And they said, okay, we've rented this from Casablanca. This is a priceless set. 
We cannot destroy it. We cannot, you know, so be very careful around it. This, this is priceless. And we're like, all right, cool. You know, and we're working all around it and I'm setting all my lights and being very careful and everything. Well, of course, Nirvana things, first thing they do is they get out there and they start throwing their guitars at it and they start bashing everything. And I'll just never forget because I was, I started whipping the turret and that's what really started to work. Like, because in camera, you would see it go from a 25 to a 100, you know, and it would jump into the thing. And that's what really started to look cool. And then Kevin Kerslake's looking at it. He says, oh my God, that looks so cool. And I look over and the producer is like, holy shit, they're destroying the priceless <laughs> set. And the, I'll never forget when Dave, uh, the drummer, Dave you Grohl. know, picked yeah. yeah, Grohl picked the whole thing up and just threw it right into the you know priceless set, and all the shit from the Casablanca thing was like snapping off, and oh my god, it was like a massive insurance claim. <laughs> That's the one yeah. thing you never do: never tell a band, "Hey, this is a priceless set." You know, we can't destroy it. <laughs> yeah, especially a band like Nirvana too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you did multiple videos for those. Um, were you, were you shooting those in LA? Was that yeah, all LA? LA yep. Yep. Uh, shooting mostly like super 16 or 16 millimeter. Yep. Uh, did a lot of super eight, like uh, smashing pumpkins, cherub rock. I shot that whole thing on super eight, oh, wow. 50 ASA in the, uh, Mount Tamalpais up in San Francisco, all at night at 50 ASA. So wow. I was like, I had 18 K's on dollies and I had all these brand, these lightning strike strobe units had just come out. So I had those and I had gone to David Pringle, the, um, the owner of lightning strikes. And I said, Hey, can, cause I, I put a piece of, you know, I put a gel in front of it. And when the lightning strike would, would, uh, ignite, it would blow a hole right through the, uh, gel, like literally melt Burn it. it. Yep. So I was like, hey, can you create these boxes so I can put them on the lightning strikes that deflect that light so I can use highly saturated colors? And he's like, let me think about that. And sure enough, he came back and he made these boxes. So when you see that video, that's all these intense colors hitting all the trees and everything that you had never really seen in a music video before because nobody could ever create that amount of 75,000 watts of power through a saturated gel that really kind of had never been done before. Yeah, that's really creative. I mean, that's, I mean, when we talk about some other stuff, you're, the, the colors you're in your direction and your vision and stuff like that, it's really, I, I think you're one of the best in the industry when it comes to that visual look. I mean, I think oh, you're doing well, some amazing you work. So much. Um, when on the music video stuff, with with the bands, I mean, these are well known bands, and this is a very you know high uh, visual music videos for this time. Obviously, the '90s were really really big about music videos and stuff like that. Was there stories and stuff brought to you, or were you guys as or, or were was the director creating the stories, or was it just like you just figure it out as we go, or what was sort of the the story for a lot of these videos? Yeah, so most of the time how it worked was the the director would bring me his treatment, right? He'd send okay. me the treatment and then he'd have like some visual, uh, you know, elements to it, whether it was still photography grabs or, you know, grabs out of a magazine or whatever, because the internet really didn't exist back <laughs> then, right? So right, you weren't yeah. going to shot deck, you know, and finding all the imagery. You had to, I have, you know, countless number is I think it's like 500 and some odd, you know, books, uh, reference books that I always, you know, pulled from back in the day. And that's something that we did together. So I would get the treatment and out of the treatment, he would always, he would send me the song. And then I just sit there and I'd listen to the song over and over. Doing a music video is very much like breaking down a script, right? You, you read the script the first time just to see what the message is. Then the second time you start to understand the character's arc. Third time you're starting to visualize the look of it, like the, the feel, the emotion of it. And the, you know, it's then it's seven and eight, nine times where you're starting to dissect it and turn it into you know, the blocking and 
cool shots or wonders or all this. You start to, well, with the music video is very much the same way. The song and the treatment work side, side, you know, together. So when I had the treatment in front of me, then I'd listen to the song. And then as the song would start to, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten times, I would start to bring the vision to life in regards to with his treatment and then a lighting design that's going to then really take what he or she wrote higher. And that's kind of what, you know, a good director of photography does. He, he takes what the script and the director's vision, and then he's able to add camera emotion and lighting emotion to then take the, the character's performance higher. So we did the same thing with bands. And during that time, there was a lot, there was a lot, it was all really still performance based because the eighties, it was all just performance. And then the nineties started to slowly envelop story into the narrative, right? It was just usually guys just playing in a, you know, in a band on stage. And then, you know, those stories started to take over and started to take hold. And that's when you started to see those directors uh, like David Fincher and uh, Mark Romanek and those guys rise out of the music videos and really get into the narrative uh, force. Was there ever any sort of artists or uh, bands or anything that were like really hands on during the shoot? Like they wanted to be really part of the creative process or was it? mostly just they just let you guys just do your thing or was there anybody that stuck out as like i really want to be a you know how how did this look i i want to i want to see the shot or anything like that yeah i mean i think um i think smashing pumpkins was was very into it so was uh nirvana or not nirvana but um stone temple pilots yeah they were a lot of fun to work with um the the Rolling Stones was really a unique experience because uh, I got flown into Mexico City. They were on tour down there, and we actually uh, filmed in a leper's colony Catholic church that had dated back to the 1300s, wow. and it was literally falling apart as we walked along the inner workings of it. And, you know, they were so much fun to work with. And, and uh, you know, I got to carry Keith's axe up a, you know, a, I had to bring it up to him because I need to adjust a light. And he's like, hey, mate, can you grab my axe? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. So I grabbed it and went up in the scissor lift because he was like three stories up on this ledge in this church. And I handed it to him. And he's like, thanks. And then I adjusted the light for him and then got back in the scissor lift and went down. And, you know, um, it was, you know, Kevin Kerr's like always had such a raw, visceral feeling for all of his work. And that's what really, you know, I had him and then I worked for Daniel Pearl, who shot some of the greatest music videos of all time. So he gave me my balls as a cinematographer. Uh, You know, Kevin Kersley gave me the rawness and experimental and like, what, what rules? We'll just break every one of them. Uh, and then I worked with this other cameraman, Joseph Yako, which was all about beauty. So I did all these music videos where it was all about the beauty and the beauty lighting. And then I ended up, you know, working for Herb Ritz for six years, uh, doing lighting all his still photography uh, from 91 to 96. So this whole, that was kind of my mentors that shaped me as, as a filmmaker. And it was awesome because I had the beauty element. I had the ballsy element. And then I had the what rules element. Uh, we're going to break every one of them. Yep. And, and, you know, all of that shows, like I said, all of those videos you worked <laughs> on are, are some of the biggest videos of the music industry. I mean, those are all really amazing videos. So, uh, you know. Excellent. And then uh, did you do any music videos with McG? I know you've done, I know you work yes. a lot with McG, but was there music videos with him? Yeah, we did. Um, God, let's see. We did uh, Cypress Hill. We did several oh, wow. Cypress Hill videos. Yeah. We also did uh, Sugar Ray 
did yep. a couple Sugar Ray videos. Um, yeah, I, I worked with him in the 90s as well when he was in his music video uh, phase. Nice, nice. So yeah. um, moving away from music videos, so I assume that was all prior to you doing feature films in L.A., right? That was music video sort of the starting process to that? Yeah, music videos from like 1988 to 96, 97, 98. And then um, I started doing commercials in uh, 94. Uh, so it was like commercials and music, music videos. And then I got offered the Rat Pack uh, for HBO. And um, that was... Uh, a, a huge opportunity for me. I, you know, I was not considered as the person they really wanted to shoot the movie. You know, Rob Cohen, the director, wanted me to shoot it. Uh, so I had to go and interview in front of six executives in, in the Black Tower um, down in Century City. And that was a fun experience, uh, getting interviewed by all of them and asking questions uh, but you know, I, I basically came out of that interview and they believed in me and said, okay, let's shoot this thing. And, and then that was my first narrative work. And that's the one that, you know, I got nominated for that and, and, uh, all that stuff. And that was kind of my coming out card. Was that, I think I remember you saying that they had a backup plan in case. Oh Yeah. Were <laughs> yeah, they have full team, full cameraman, whole other grip and electric team all on standby for the first week waiting for me to fail. Isn't that a great way to start your uh, narrative career? Yeah, well, what it was good. Well, I didn't find that out, of course, you know, because uh, if Rob would have told me that on day one, I was like, what the hell? But he told me when we wrapped. Yeah. Uh, he goes, I just want you to know, I'm so proud of you, what you did. And I just wanted to tell you that the studio didn't believe in you. And this is what they, you know, uh, set up. Uh, but, you know, that was that they were doing what any good studio would do. You know, it's an they, investment. Yeah, I, I, I'm like this little rock video shooter, you know, and, and all of a sudden I'm getting a narrative piece that's a period piece with with Frank Sinatra and all the boys and all, how, how is he able to going to be able to pull this off? But it was great because when they saw the first two days of dailies, they were like, who is this guy? This is because I went extreme with it. I didn't want it to be this like period piece, nostalgia, you know, movie of the week thing. So my yeah. exposures were like, you looked at stuff and you're like, whoa, this is different. And that's what I really wanted to uh, convey. Hey, thanks for watching part one of our interview with Shane Hobart. We hope you enjoyed it. You can check out our other episodes on YouTube and on all your favorite podcast locations. Just search for Tales from the Pit photo and also at talesfromthepit.net. We'll see you next time.